Hi. I want to say that it's nice to see you again, but I, I can't. I will imagine your friendly and smiling faces, however. Please continue to take care of yourselves and each other. Let us also honor the land on which we live and worship. We acknowledge the land upon which we are meeting. It is a shared land with the Anishinaabe, Ojibwe peoples of the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850 and the Sault Ste. Marie Historic Métis Council. We are called to be partners in caring for creation and giving glory to God, our Creator. Good morning. The lighting of the Christ candle is a reminder that there is no darkness that cannot, be, cannot benefit from the light of Christ's example and teaching in our world. It is also a reminder to each of us that light is best shared, never hidden. As we worship together this day, even though it is through the all too familiar medium of screens, we unite in recalling these words of the psalmist. This is from Psalm 36, verses 5 to 7. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love. O God, all people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Together we join in prayer. God, enfold us in your refuge and guide us in the direction you lead. We bring our wondering and needful selves to you this day as we look to you in worship and praise. Give us a mindful approach today, knowing and feeling that we share this time with the rest of our worshiping community. Amen. I have a short children's message. Um, every now and then I, I like to imagine that there are children in the viewing audience. And this one is called Ask a Kid. I've grown up with ministers having children's messages, and usually they are a message with a moral delivered to the children. But I sometimes think we should have a message from the children. Even though we do not see great numbers of children in our actual congregations anymore, or even our viewing congregations, we know that children often have a strong connection to God's truth, to justice, and to an uncomplicated love and acceptance. Kelly Wallace is a digital reporter for CNN who became interested in how children saw God when she sat down to write an article about a book by Monica Parker. And it was on that topic, How Children See God. So Wallace decided to ask her own children how they saw God. And the youngest one said that she thought God was the moral in all stories, and she believes all stories have a, a wise moral to tell. The oldest daughter thought about the power of God and said that God controls everything. In asking a number of children the same question, the author Monica Parker discovered a variety of equally as interesting answers. But she came away with one overwhelming impression. Parker said that the responses show that children are open-hearted and open-minded. They may come from different religions, but there was never a sense their thoughts about God set them apart. Parker said, I felt as though it were a very open club that we could all join. 
I never felt that one child would have ever said, my God is better than your God. They would not use their beliefs as an excuse to hate or diminish another human being. If you have children in your life, perhaps you can have a good chat with them about God. And instead of teaching and preaching, do some listening. I think we could learn a lot. Our first hymn is from Voices United, 299, Teach Me God to Wonder. Now there are varieties of gifts, 
but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit cho chooses. This is the reading of God's holy word for this morning. May God bless to our understanding these holy words. Amen. Our next hymn is number 595 in Voices United, We Are Pilgrims, the Servant Song. Isaiah 
sure knew how to rally positive feelings and outlooks. Isaiah's gift given and then shared was to speak of the sublime comfort and hope that God gives. Growing up in a well-attended Sunday school, I remember lots of lessons about talents. We were asked to think about what gift or what talent we could bring to God. I carried that notion with me into my adult years, and I recall bemoaning a certain lack of gifts. I could easily list gaping holes in the fabric of my talents. I wonder if any of you have ever felt that way, that your gifts were meager in comparison to the magnitude of God and to the need we see in our world. The song, The Little Drummer Boy, might be fresh in your mind. The Little Drummer Boy did not feel that he had any manner of gift similar to the other gifts that were being given to Jesus. In fact, the song's words say, I have no gift to bring. I am a poor boy. Clearly, this is an interpretation of a gift as being something tangible and maybe even a little pricey. But in the spirit of honoring Jesus and giving what he good, could, the little drummer boy then asked, Shall I play for you? He didn't try to do everything, and he didn't try to be competitive. Instead, he did his best with the talent that he was given, and he in turn gave it to Jesus. He shared his gift of music. I know the song is fictitious, but its popularity suggests that there is something very real in that message. Our three-year-old grandson gave us a Christmas gift this year that ranks really high on my list of favorites. When we were finally able to visit them in Michigan, both grandsons were excited to see us, and they made cards for us, and they found things in their possession that they could give to us as gifts. Our oldest grandson knows that we love books, so he sorted through his titles and he found some he thought we would like. But when we opened the three-year-old's envelope, Nash, his name is, it was filled with marbles. One of his most favorite keepsakes in the world. And no, he didn't give it to us because he thought we were losing ours. He was giving us something precious out of pure love. What a gift. There once was a man who sold everything that he had and then melted the gold so that it became one huge lump. Then he buried it in a field and each day he would visit that spot and stare lovingly at the place where he had buried his treasure. His servant had noticed his daily trips and one day decided to follow him secretly. You guessed it. When the master left, the servant dug up the gold and ran away, never to be seen again. When the master discovered this the next day, he wailed and screamed so loudly that a passerby heard him and ran over, What's wrong? Are you hurt? Well, the master explained his predicament, and he admitted that his only real joy in life had been to come to the field and gaze at the spot where his treasure was buried. The passerby was incredulous and asked, You never did anything with the money? You were never going to spend it or use it for anything? Well, in that case, just take a stone and cover that hole where your gold used to be and visit that stone every day. You will be no worse off than before when your gold was there and you weren't using it anyway. The message is, if your treasures are not put to use, what good are they? 
In our efforts to honor our Lord, in our recognition of the distance between what we have and the greatness of God, we sometimes need to be reminded of what treasures we do have and what we can put to use. In our many hours of at-home time lately, some of us, me anyway, have watched an abundance of TV or Netflix or other streaming services. On those shows that we watch, the first credits that are listed usually go to the stars of the show, the actors and singers, with names that you and I might easily recognize. But we also know that so many other talents are important, musical, writing, stage production, editing, costume, and lighting talents, all those go together to make that show. Too often our society holds up one talent as being more special than others, without acknowledging that all are crucial and must combine to create the finished product. Exodus 35, verse 30, verses 31 to 33, tells of a man named Bezalel, who was filled with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. He could design artistic works. He could work in gold and silver and bronze. He could cut jewels for setting and carve wood. He doesn't get top billing in the Bible for these talents, but these talents were valuable nonetheless. You see, Bezalel and other artisans used their abilities to fashion all of the elements needed for the tabernacle. You may recall that the tabernacle was a large tent structure that served as God's meeting place with the people. The craftsmen used their skills to make important elements, such as the Ark of the Covenant, the table for showbread, the golden lampstand, and other things. When they completed the work, Moses set all the elements in place inside of the tabernacle, and then something amazing happened. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. From Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. If Bezalel and other artisans had not used their talents to build the objects of the tabernacle, there would have been no revered meeting place for God and the people. All of those background gifts are important. I listened to an Order of Canada recipient interviewed on CBC Radio early in the new year. His name is Mohamed Faki, owner of the growing business Paramount Fine Foods and organizer and benefactor of many charitable acts. He came to Canada from Lebanon in 1999. He was an immigrant with more hope and energy than money. He worked menial jobs, and he had a few breaks along the way. In the radio interview, he was proud of the fact that he was getting the, the Order of Canada, and he spoke glowingly of Canada and Canadians. But at one point, he stressed that those kinds of honors, the Order of Canada, that was great, but there were so many other people in the world that did wonderful things that were as important as what he considered he was doing. He mentioned a smile of acknowledgement and encouragement from a passing stranger that might have been just what he needed at the exact right moment. So many in the church and in the giving and caring part of our society are like Bezalel and like the passing strangers Mohammed mentioned and like all those people who receive small print credits in the shows we watch. They give their gifts with expertise and purpose and generosity. They are often engaged in hard work that leads to some kind of assistance or even glory for other people. 
but they do not bemoan that fact because theirs is a reward of a different nature. God has given us each gifts and talents. If you do not possess a stage-worthy or choir-worthy singing voice, perhaps you are good at organizing events such as fundraisers. If you are not rich enough to single-handedly support every charity known to humankind, perhaps you are a good listener and conversationalist who likes to phone people who are longing to hear your voice. If you are not a charismatic leader who easily inspires followers, perhaps you are an excellent problem solver who makes wise suggestions and can mediate disputes when you discover that there's a problem in the complaint rather than a problem in the complainer. There's lots of talents to explore. Like the drummer boy, Choose a gift to offer to God. If you need to fine-tune it a bit, ask for God's guidance and take the time you need. That time will not be the same as bearing a treasure in order to daily gaze at it, as the man in our story did. Rather, that time will become God's encouraged time, preparing you for the demands that will be made on your gift. Remember, Jesus did not start his personal ministry right after the Christmas story. He took the time needed to grow in mind and body and to learn about, develop, and appreciate his own skills. Also, Jesus' gifts shared then and now did not come without effort. Recall the desert, the ministry, the cross. To recap from scripture, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. You are important to God, and you have been given gifts. You have much to offer to God here within this church and outside of the church in a world aching for your brand of kindness and generosity. How amazing we will be as disciples of Jesus when we encourage one another and then join our gifts together. Amen. You continue to be generous and to share your gifts with the church and with people outside of the church. Let us bow our heads now in prayer. Generous God, we are grateful for your many gifts to us and we hear your call to share. Please show us opportunities and guide us in our desire to help others. Help each of us also to recognize and encourage the gifts that others have, because sometimes they may not see what we see, what you see. When there is need for financial resources to maintain this place of worship, guide us in our giving. When there is need for skills and talents to enhance this place of worship, guide us in our giving. And when we are aware of other needs outside of this place of worship, guide us in our giving. Amen. Now let us bow our heads in prayer for the prayers of the people, which will conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Dear God, hear the prayers of our hearts today. Know our cares for family and friends, and for those we do not know personally, but we acknowledge their pain. Keep steering us in the right direction this year. We ask that you help us feel overwhelmed by your goodness and our own purpose each and every day. Be with Reverend Hattie in his ministry here and his visits elsewhere. 
Together, we pray as you have lovingly guided us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn is a peppy one. It's 424, May the God of Hope Go With Us. song that I mentioned, the little drummer boy, amidst all of the parumpa pum pums are the words, are these words. Come, they told me, our newborn king to see, our finest gifts we bring to lay before the king, so to honor him when we come. I hesitate to even suggest that it is our Christian responsibility to share our gifts. Responsibility can sometimes seem like a heavy word. So instead, I say, embrace the joy that gift sharing gives. May you feel that joy amidst holy love and acceptance as you move away from this service and move into a different kind of service. God's blessings are abiding.